Hey, y'all. Happy Mon uh, Monday. Good grief. I'm a day ahead already. Happy Sunday to everybody. Um, sorry for the abrupt intro. It's um, just a little inside baseball here. I have started using StreamYard rather than uh, going with the OBS software. Um, I find that the OBS software was causing more problems than it was fixing. So I uh, switched over to StreamYard. Um, my partner, Eloy Escajedo, and I use it every week for our Trampled Underfoot podcast. And I have resisted using it for a couple of reasons. There are things I can do here in StreamYard that I can't do in OBS. But there are a few things in OBS that I can't do in StreamYard. So it was kind of a balancing act. Probably the number one thing that bugs me is the fact that StreamYard has not yet come up with a black uh, screen. It's all bright white. So you can see the reflection of everything in my glasses when I look up. So I have to kind of constantly do that library and look over the top of my. Uh, of my glasses thing and there is no pop out chat. So the chat is off to the side. So it looks like I'm not looking at the camera, but I have to do that to read your questions over here. So it's just getting used to the new setup and a bunch of different issues. So be that as it may, Howdy. Um, I do plan on putting in a, uh, a little video introduction at the beginning, more of a voiceover, no music. I'm not a theme music kind of guy. Um, it's just not um, what's it's just not my style. Uh, before I get into questions, I will show this question. Uh, Roger Roger wants to know, is this live event about stack text? Yes, it is. It's about. It's answering questions folks had on the video I released earlier this morning. It's a chance for you to ask questions that maybe you were confused about something I didn't explain well enough, or maybe you have another take on something. So I do this every week. I do the, uh, I release it. Well, not every week. Let me rephrase that. Re-engage your brain, Mark. I release a video every other week, but I have a live Q&A every week. And the live Q&As when I haven't released a video are just open Q&As. If you have a question or just want to chit-chat, we do that. Uh, but on the weeks that I do post a video, the video is dedicated to answering questions. Uh, the live Q&A is dedicated to answering questions about the video released earlier today. So. Okay, <laughs> with that all behind me, I'd like to draw your attention to a link I put in the description box of this video, and it's going to stay there for a while. Uh, those of you who follow me on Facebook and those of you who are part of the Gatton CNC group or who are friends with Dave Gatton, you know that uh, about mid-April, April 16th as a matter of fact, he suffered a massive heart attack and was rushed to two different hospitals and uh, basically had a quadruple bypass. He is home now. He is improving. He's getting better, but he could use our help. Now, Dave is a good friend of mine. He got me into CNC. He is my Obi-Wan. He's the one who showed me that I can do this. And um, he has helped literally hundreds of people around the world either with plans or CNC kits for the last six, seven years. And I, my opinion, it was time for me to pay him back. There is a GoFundMe to help him cover some of the expenses that are coming in. Ambulance trips, this, that, and the other. He does have insurance, but uh, if you've ever had any kind of heart surgery, you know that uh, insurance doesn't cover everything. 
he could use our help. So there is a link in the description box of this video to a GoFundMe. Um, if you can spare a few dollars, I know times are tight. I know that folks have uh, been laid off or they're out of work. I know that folks are struggling, but if you can spare a few dollars, please hit that link and um, help him out. I mean, this guy is one of the bigs in the CNC community. He has helped literally hundreds of people get up and get going and start home-based businesses, start small businesses, then eventually work their way up to big businesses. So he could use our help now, and I think it would be greatly appreciated if you could click that link and throw him a few dollars. Um, and that's what I'll say about that this week. So <laughs> with the behind-the-scenes stuff out of the way, let's start getting into some of the questions about today's video. Um, this morning's video was about stack text. The absolute number one requested thing that you guys have wanted to see me cover. And full disclosure, I have not yet gone out and carved that sign. I finally got the old shed cleaned out to where I can get to the CNC. Now I got to get some material clamp down to it and cut the sign out because I know there was a question about finishing it. This was kind of a difficult video for me to do simply because there's a lot of information to put out there. And I kept making references to templates on purpose. That's going to be the next video in this series. And that'll be not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. The lion's share of the work, the bulk of the work is setting up that first project. And when that's finished, everything becomes a lot easier. You can open up the template file and go in and change project sizes. You can change names, you can change dates, everything else, and it'll all fall into place. It's getting that initial design set up and more or less telling that so the software and that template what you want it to do that takes the, the most time. Now, I cut that video down to from about an hour and 10 minutes. I cut it down to the 53 minutes that ended up being released. So it's... It's hard to not put that much. It, it's hard to not put that much info into one video. But the reason I had to split it up was it would have been two hours if I'd have brought in the template discussion. So that'll be the next video. So um, let's get into some of the questions here. Uh, let's see. Let's get going down here and try to find them. Several thank yous, uh, and thank you, folks. Let's see here. Rick French says, uh, what does adding the second pass and clearing the pockets do to carve time? That wasn't mentioned at all. I'm presuming that it doubles it. Can the feed be sped up for the second pass? Yes, and yes, and yes. However, having said that, uh, looking at... Let me bring it up here. Well, this is going to be interesting. This will be my first screen share live with uh, StreamYard. So we'll do this and this. Then I have to jump over to this. If we go over here to... Uh, let me make sure that I am sharing. Am I sharing? I can't tell. Yes, I am. Okay, cool. That's one of the other things that bugs me about StreamYard. If we go over here into the Tool Paths tab and we look at the Tool Paths summary, we can see the entire project is a two-hour project. Now, that may be too much. That may be too little. And that's also based on my feeds and speeds. 
that's with a rapid rate of uh, 200 inches per minute. And um, let's see, for each individual bit, I have various feed rates for my quarter inch end mill. I have a feed rate of 60 inches per minute. I would probably increase that on the machine when I see how the, uh, how the bit is cutting and how the material is reacting. So let's see for the eighth inch bit, 50 inches per minute. And then for the 16th inch bit, uh, 40 inches per minute, those might change though. They may not change. But as it sits, it's not that long of a carve. So it's it just depends on your it depends on your setup. It depends on how fast you can run your tools and how the material is reacting to it. Now, one thing I have noticed in, it's been my experience that when you're going for a smooth bottom surface, increasing the feed rate is not always the way to go. Simply because you do introduce, you reintroduce bit deflection and any flex that may be in your machine. Now, if you've got a big industrial CNC that's welded, you know, six inch steel uh, box tubing, you probably don't have a whole heck of a lot of flex. But if you're running an X carve or a Shapeoko, there's going to be a little bit of flex in there. So by by shaving off just that thin little skin it reduces the amount of flex or the amount of bit deflection that you're going to get. Yes, it does add time, but my question is this, would you rather spend a little bit more time on the machine or a lot more time trying to sand out those machining marks? I mean, it's a trade-off and the choice is yours. If you don't mind getting in there and sanding those machining marks out, then, you know, be my guest. But personally, I'd rather let it sit on the machine a little bit longer than try to get in there and, you know, use uh, finger files or fingernail files or anything else to try to sand those machining marks out. So that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. KP, thank you very much for the super chat. I really, really do appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, uh, Russell has an excellent point here. Time saved rushing the cutter is spent later cleaning up and sanding. I agree with that sentiment 100%. I, I really, really agree with that big time. Um, we, when we tend to think of it in terms of machine time, I would much rather let the machine do the work than do it myself. So, you know, just me. Um, Kent Turner said, I would like to see your technique on painting stack signs. I don't really have a technique, but I'm, I will show you uh, how I do it. It's, um, it's not really very different from any other technique. The only thing is what you can do if you have the time to leave it on the machine is run your top text toolpath, then paint the next surface, then run the bottom text toolpath. You know, that will, it, it, it's kind of a trade off. It may save a little bit of, of time and it may eliminate a bunch of uh, extra clean, cleanup. But, you know, the choice is yours. Uh, I will be getting into uh, carving and painting it after I'm done with it. So we'll see what happens. So, and uh, I can take that off here. And we'll cruise on down and see if there are any. I know there are more questions, but uh, just got to now find them here. A lot of thank yous for the video. 
Thank you. One thing I did not cover, and I, I forgot to, there's a couple of things I didn't mention, was that, uh, yes, I did it in Aspire, but this also works in Cut 2D, Desktop and Pro, VCarve, Desktop and Pro, and of course, Aspire. The only thing that cannot be done in uh, cut 2d is the v carving now there's a way you can kind of get around that you can do a profile tool path with a set depth and a v bit but you're not going to get the squared corners that you would get in v carving but i would definitely definitely look into upgrading to vcarve pro if v or vcarve desktop either one if v carving is uh one of the things that you're thinking about doing it's very very worth it very well worth it there are a lot of things in uh vcarve that just aren't included with cut 2d now cut 2d cut 2d has its place but you know what can you say <laughs> it's it, it's it's kind of a um a balancing act there too with income versus uh, expense. And I personally believe that tools and software is never an expense. It's an investment. So Jack Matson, thank you very much for the super chat. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, he says, let's get the shed done. I'm in firm agreement with you. And the minute insulation comes in, we can do that. It's still out of stock. I am, I believe me, I am like a dog on dog on a bone with this. That's what I'm waiting on. You know, it's just, oh, come on, please. Uh, let's see. Um, Aaron Hansen says, pulled the trigger and updated to Aspire this week. Good on you. I mean, just, and dive into it. Get into all of the tutorials that you can. Just use it. Holy cow, Brian Harkin. Thank you very much for the super chat. You guys, um, you, you guys are the best viewers on YouTube. Thank you. I really do appreciate you all. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brian Harkin says, could you show us how to use that file as a template? That's the next video. I, I tried to make this video informative, yet as short as possible. But again, there were a lot of things that went into this video. So, and a lot of information. I hope it wasn't too much. So, let's see. Um, I know I'm jumping all over the place here. I'm trying to go up to the top and get your questions in order. But it's kind of slow going here. And okay, let's see. Steve Martin says, if a tapered ball nose or flat bottom V-bit is used, do you need to take account of the part of the V-point is missing? How is this accounted for? I did see a video about this many months or years ago. With a flat bottom V-bit, it, it, okay, two things. It depends on the tool path that you're using. And it depends on how you entered that tool into the database. Now, you, there's a way to cheat the system. Okay. If you normally a V bit with a flat bottom is considered an engraving bit. So if you enter that in your tool database as an engraving bit, and then you go to use it in a V carve tool path, you may get some error in there. But if you, Let's say you have a 60 degree V bit uh, engraving bit with a flat bottom. If you put that in the uh, in your router or spindle, but in the software you said it's a standard V bit with a point, the software doesn't know the difference. The software doesn't control what you put in the spindle outside on the CNC machine. So I would say this is one of those times when you should practice with scrap 
and see what kind of outcome you get. Now, if you are carving to a flat depth, you got to remember that the software vCarve or Aspire, whichever, is going to assume that that bit has a point. If that if that point isn't there, if there's a flat bottom, there's going to be a discrepancy on the cutting depth. You're still going to get the edges that you want, but it's not going to cut as deeply as you think it's going to. So in the areas where you have a clearance tool cleaning out, say, the inside of a circle or the inside of a square, up in those corners where that radius is, where that clearance bit can't get, the engraving bit is not going to cut as deep because that point is not there. So that's something to consider. Um, the best bet is to experiment with it and see how much of a difference there is going to be. Now, if you enter it as an engraving bit with that width as a, in the tool database and then use that for a V carving, it may or may not work. There are certain bits that have a that have a real wide flat tip and it will read that diameter and not let it get up into corners the way you would hope it would. It really depends on the bit. You can kind of cheat the system, but there are trade-offs there. So let's see. Um, head back down here. Um, Lewis Denton wants to know, is there a video on setting up template files? Yes, I did create a video on template files and I will, I just made a note to myself to link it in the description of this video as soon as we finish going live, but a good portion of this morning's video was talking about setting up a template file it's one thing to you can save anything as a template file but if you if you set it up knowing if you design the file knowing you're going to create a template out of it you can save yourself a lot of heartache later on and that was the reason for putting everything on a separate um on a separate layer within this video it, because as you'll see uh, next video I release, when we take that template file, we go to those layers, change a few things, then jump over. And because the tool paths are all associated with those layers, just recalculate all tool paths and it's done, then preview it. That's why I mean when I say the lion's share of the work is getting the template set up. That's the hard part. And once you get that template set up, the rest of it is simple. Now, I'm going to probably regret this, but I would say this video today was 53 minutes long. The next video may be 20 minutes. And that's with me explaining everything as I do and getting too pedantic about things. But uh, yes, I did do a separate video on setting up template files. And uh, I'll put a link to that down in the description of uh, this video as soon as we're finished here to uh, live. Lewis Denton, holy cow, thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. You guys are, you guys are the, I, I say it a lot and it sounds like a cliche, but I really mean it when I say you guys are the best viewers on YouTube. I mean, you really are. Uh, let's see, Bill Baggins, I see what you did there. Just starting out CNC, pro or desktop, eventually want 3D though. Okay, you're the only one that can make that choice. VCarve desktop has features, or excuse me, VCarve Pro has features that VCarve desktop doesn't have. You'll have to decide if that's worth it to you. Go over to Vectrix website and there is a comparison there a software comparison that will show you everything that comes with all of the different levels of software it also depends on the size of your machine 
if your machine's cutting area is less than, I believe it's 24 inches square, there may not be any advantage to going with Pro. Now, you can carve 3D models in VCarve Desktop and VCarve Pro. You just can't create them because they are not 3D modeling software. That's Aspire. So, you, if you follow Michael Mazalik on his YouTube channel, and there's a link to today's video that Michael's going to be doing, um, which is, believe it or not, parametric carving in uh, Aspire. I think V-Carve, but I'm not really sure. Michael, if you could help me out. I know it's Aspire, but he's going to be getting into parametric uh, carving. Um, and that's today at 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern. So can't wait for that. But if you follow Michael Mazalik, he is my 3D guru. The man is an artist, and that's all there is to say. So, uh, Rick French, holy cow, thank you very much. I really do appreciate that super chat. I really appreciate it more than you'll ever know. Uh, Robert Dymock says, sorry. Well, I hope you brought a note because, you know, one more unexcused tardiness and it's detention. So, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Let me go back up here. I think there were a couple of other questions. Um, got to that. Okay. Suicidal at all times. I has a simple question. None of them are simple. When making a drawing, how do you make lines to dimensions? Can you click and type in a length? Yes. And let's see. I did a video on that. I will have to remember the title on drawing vectors to a specific size. Um, I'll have to look for it because I don't remember which one it was. I believe it was vector creation, but I'm not sure. Um, but yes, you can uh, type in an angle, a length all that other good stuff and have it come up to that specific length. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out which video it is and I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. Give me about 10 minutes after we're finished live here. Okay. Um, but yes, very excellent question. Let's see here now. And we're going down here to okay larry randolph what bits would you recommend for this project that's a toughie uh in this project in the video this morning i used a quarter inch end mill for main clearance then an eighth inch end mill to as a kind of a medium clearance tool that would get in and uh clear out some of the smaller areas faster than the 16th inch bit. And then I used a 16th inch bit as a final profile, just basically around the inside and the outside of the uh, text. Now I could, it, as I showed in there, there are a few areas where even that little one 16th inch bit didn't get in there and uh, carve everything out. But you got to remember, we're dealing with round bits. I could go in and add another smaller bit, but that's going to add more machine time. And for something that's going to hang up above eye level on uh, above our doorway, I think she wants to put it uh, to our bedroom. It's it, it, it and that's well, anyway. Uh, it's not going to be seen. So I'll just paint it the same color as the background. I mean, now if it's going to be something that's, you know, going to be close at hand that you're really looking into, like the, the top of a, uh, the top of a jewelry box or something like that, then you might get in and use some smaller bits. But that's the great thing about the new pocket tool paths, the way Vectric has redone them 
is that you can get in and use as many tools as you want. And um, I haven't found a limit yet. I don't know if there is, but I haven't found a limit to the number of tools that you can put in there yet. I guess it just depends on how, on how persnickety for lack of a better word that uh it, that you want to get you know so uh let's see dave blackburn thank you very much for the super chat i really do appreciate it you guys are going crazy thank you i, I really appreciated that okay steve purdue wants to know are you using down cut or up cut bits yes um my attitude is this if you are wanting a nice top surface you use a down cut bit if you're interested in a nice bottom surface you use an up cut bit now in this um example with the text on text we want both so i'm using a down cut bit and that's another reason the um the that doing that thin skin yes steve martin persnickety <laughs> branded <laughs> that's uh, another reason for machining off that thin skin a down cut bit will tend to try to lift the material an up cut bit will tend to try to push the material down or do i have that backwards I have that backwards. A down cut bit will attempt to push the material down, whereas an up cut bit will attempt to try to pull the material up. So it goes back to feed rates and it goes to plunge rates and um, how sharp your tool is and the type of material. If I'm carving this out of pine, it's not going to be that difficult because pine isn't very dense. It just likes to shred. I don't like carving softwoods. Cedar is okay, but I don't like carving softwoods. So it's going to be an experience carving this one out. We'll see what happens. So, but yes, I use both. But in this situation, on this particular project, all of my bits are down cut bits. So, um, Mr. Coffee Paul, how do you, whoops, wrong one. Uh, how do you spell persnickety? Not like that. But other than that, any way you'd like. <laughs> okay, let's see. I.L. Peleg says it would be interesting to know how much time is saved by the middle sized bit compared to not having it there and is it worth the tool change time well again that's entirely up to you the here's how we can you can find out by doing the project and calculate one set of tool paths with that middle bit and one set of tool paths without it my goal in using that eighth inch bit that middle size bit was to save that smaller bit because the less work it's got to do, the better. Because that's a very tiny, tiny bit. So, what can I say? <laughs> and again, I really don't have any issue with... Um, I, I really don't have any issue with uh, more machine time. I really don't. I'm a home hobbyist. I'm not trying to make a living with it. Um, so what can I say? Uh, let's see. Eric Girth placing too much emphasis on trivial or minor details. Fussy. She's very persnickety about her food. Bingo. Score yourself five bonus points. So let's see. Um, all right. Mario Montoya says, I'm having an issue with 2D tabs leaving a groove from the bottom of the material to the top on a profile cutout. I'm using a last pass of 0 0.005. 
any ideas as to how to fix that? Yes. Um, maybe go with a little bit more of an allowance on the uh, last pass. Uh, you're using five thousandths of an inch. You might bump it up to ten thousandths and ramp in your plunge moves. That ramping in will help. And um, I, I would increase just that uh, last pass allowance. So let's see here. Uh, suicidal at all times says sound, but no video. Oh, really? Um, well, I've got sound and video over here. I've got the, you might refresh your, uh, browser. So, all right, let's see. Um, let's. Okay, and James Martin. Okay, you asked this question in the comments, I believe. Make sure that this was you. Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. I was going getting ready to get to that. How do we obtain the same result of the multiple tools feature from Aspire 10.5 in older versions? Okay, if it's specifically about the multiple tools feature, you really can't. Now, having said that, what you can do is you can create offset vectors. Uh, you could, um, let's say, figure out where your clearance, your, for instance, your quarter inch end mill, figure out where that clearance is, that, that quarter inch end mill can get into then create an offset vector that will cover that area and do that on a pocket tool path. Then take that same um, offset vector and the vectors you want to carve and do that as a separate tool path with the clearance tool. So you would use your largest tool on the outside using your outside border and that offset vector outwards to cover all the clearance outside. Then use that offset vector and your text vectors. Use your middle bit as your large area clearance tool and your small bit as your final tool. Does that make sense? You know, I, I might be able to, I might be able to tack that on to the template file no i won't do it on the template file video i'll i'll put that on a on another separate video i uh, just made a note of myself to do something like that however let me throw this at you why wouldn't you update to the newest version of aspire i mean I, yeah i know there's an expense there but believe me when i say again it's an investment not a um it, it it's an investment it's not an expense I, I would upgrade i really would upgrade so let's see here and the expense of upgrading from the older version to the newer version you are missing out on so much you really are there's a bunch of new tool paths in there that um, tool paths and drawing tools and everything else. So uh, let's see here. Let me um, see how long have I been on? Eh, not quite 40 minutes. Uh, let's see. Okay, here, Michael Holhut. I'm joining late after watching your last video. Okay, now that's an excused tardiness. So you're covered. No detention. Did you already discuss where you re-zero between tool changes in this project? I don't generally talk about re-zeroing uh, in the software portion. I will talk about it when I go outside and cut on the machine. But... The thing about, and this is a mistake I see a lot of people making, and I'm going to do a video when I ever I get the shed pick, set up out there and get the machine moved. 
I'm going to do a video specifically on this subject. After you have set your X and Y zero, you do not change it until the project is finished and off the machine. There is no reason to change the X, Y, zero unless you have a power failure or a machine problem or a computer issue or some controller issue or something like that. The only zero you reset after you change tools is the Z zero. And that's because the tool length is undoubtedly different. So you do not change your X, Y, zero when you do a tool change. You only change the Z zero. So that's the only, that's the only thing I reset. Okay, let's see. Excuse. Excuse me. Uh, let's see. Holy cow. Uh, tides rolling. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. I'm new to CNC and just got the Bulkman 3D 1010. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I ordered the UC 300 USB for Mach 3. Okay. Is this legacy equipment or fine for a beginner? You know what? I really have no idea. I really have no idea. I'm not uh, familiar with the UC 300. Um, and I'm certainly not familiar with the Bulkman 3D 1010. My, let's see, my advice would be, I don't know, even know who makes that. Who makes the bulks? Nah. Who makes the Bulkman 3D 1010? I really have no idea. I would try to get a hold of them. Having said that, is this legacy equipment or fine for a beginner? You already have it. So now is the time to learn how to use it. Uh, open builds. Okay, I would go over to open builds. I know they have a support forum. I know they do. Go over to open builds support forum. Yeah. Um, in case you're wondering, he's, whoops, wrong one. Yeah, uh, in case you're wondering, he said it's open builds. Yes, by all means, go over to open builds and join their support forum and ask machine specific questions over there. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about their machines. Um, if you're thinking maybe you got in over your head or you're just kind of wondering if this is a good machine for a beginner, I'd have to say that just about any machine out there is good for a beginner. You're going to learn the process no matter what machine you buy. If it's too much for you, you'll find out. If it's not enough, you'll also find out. But that comes with growth and that comes with improving your knowledge and your skill set. For machine specific questions, I would head over to Open Builds and join their forum, join that support group over there and ask those machine specific questions over there. But I'd say, yeah, it's it's a good machine for a beginner. Um, the process is the same no matter what machine you start with. The only thing you have to consider is, is it the machine that's going to do what you want it to do? And you know, without knowing the size or any size issues that you have, I would say if you're going to start small, which you should, um, yes, it's more than it's more than enough machine. So I see Dave Gatton, the man, the myth, the legend is here. Um, he's in love with his pillow. And um, that's because Mervyn Schumacher out there, Poppy's Woodshed, asked him that question specifically. Glad to see you with us, Dave. Thank you very much for joining. I really appreciate it. And remember, guys, the link to the GoFundMe to help Dave get and take care of his expenses is down in the description of this video. Anything you can do to help is greatly appreciated. So let's see. Um, okay. Jeffrey Stewart has a very long multifaceted question here. 
and this will probably be the last one for today. I created a CRV file with six pockets, half inch by a quarter inch roughly. And okay, I needed to change that file with six pockets to, okay, you needed to make the pockets larger in X and Y. Okay, the 2D view shows my change. However, the 3D view does not. And the pockets cut on the CNC router or still just, did you recalculate the toolpaths? You have to recalculate the toolpaths, not just saving G code. Now, if you have saved the tap file, if you've already saved the G code, but now you have to go back and adjust the drawing, delete that old G code. Get rid of that G code before you make those modifications. Then fix your drawing, change your drawing, recalculate those tool paths, then generate G code. That should be, that should fix it. So, and that's one of the reasons why I don't save G code. I, I, I don't save. <laughs> there are, with a few exceptions, I, in my uh, how to make a keyhole video, uh, how to enter a keyhole bit and make a keyhole toolpath, I created G code for a three quarter inch tall vertical keyhole, a one inch tall vertical keyhole, a two inch wide horizontal keyhole, and a three inch wide horizontal keyhole. I saved those G codes and I still use them. My X and Y zero is set to the center so I can measure down where I want to put the keyhole, find the center of my material. And then so long as I set my X and Y zero there, I know that on the vertical keyhole, it's going to come down a little bit, plunge in, move up, come back down and lift out. So I just find where I want that keyhole to be, the center of where I want that keyhole to be. And then I run that G code. But normally, I do not save G code at all. Not one bit. So, but yes, recalculate the tool paths, then save new G code because the tool paths do not automatically recalculate. So, uh, let's see. Um, Mr. Coffee Paul, actually, great point if someone wants to give a talk about Mach 3. If you are not subscribed to Dave Gatton's CNC channel, not Dave Gatton's CNC, Dave Gatton's YouTube channel, uh, you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, I'll put a link in the description to his uh, YouTube channel. And he has got a lot of videos on Mach 3. Dave has forgotten more about Mach 3 than I've ever used or that I've ever learned. Um, it's, it's kind of specific. So I kind of stay away from, um, doing Mach 3 videos. And that's mainly because with Mach 4 out there, which I have never used, I think that me talking about Mach 3 specific, uh, subjects and topics would kind of be the equivalent of me promoting or endorsing Mach 3. And I that's that's not my intent at all. Um, also, to me, Mach 3 is just a controller. It's a set it and forget it type of a thing. I use maybe one-tenth of its capacity, if that. And there are a lot of things in Mach 3 that I have never even looked at, let alone used, changed, or touched. And I have no interest in getting in there and playing around with it. There are all kinds of little wizards where you can go cut a circle. Well, that's fine and dandy, but it's just as easy for me to make a tool path in uh, VCarve, save the G code and go out and cut it. And if I'm honest, depending upon whether it's an inside or outside circle, I'll probably just use a drill and be done with it. You know, CNC is not always the, the right tool for the job. So, okay, let's see. Um, I didn't mean to embarrass Dave out of here, but, um, and then Mervyn said, sorry, didn't mean to change this 
to the heart attack channel. You haven't Mervin, but I mean, you know, we got to give credit where credit is due. So let's see. Um, have we got any more? Um, questions it doesn't look like it so here is yep i think that's about it okay um the next video not next week but the week after next is going to be taking this template file that we created in the video i released this morning and i'm going to go open up the template I'm going to change names. I'm going to change dates. I'm going to change fonts. I may change sizes. I don't know. Probably not. But uh, we'll get into all that and then uh, show you how easy it is to recalculate these tool paths and cut that file and be done with it. I won't actually go outside and cut it, but I'll show you uh, recalculating the tool pass, then shape, save the G code for it and be gone. So that's week after next. Next week will be open chat, open Q&A. So if you have any general CNC questions or uh, Aspire VCAR cut 2D questions, that will be the place for it. Um, in about a little over an hour from now, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. Michael Mazalik will be premiering his video on, let's see, what is it? Uh, parametric designing with V Carve and Aspire. So it is both. So I hope to see everybody there. I will be there in the chat. And um, other than that, thank you very much to everyone for the super chats. Thank you very much to everyone who has hit those donation links down in the description of this video. Thank you very much to everyone who has hit those links and donated to the GoFundMe to help Dave Gatton recover from his quadruple bypass. Holy cow. Thank you sincerely from me to you. And so let's go do something cool for the next hour and then uh, meet up over on Michael's video. All right. Thank you very much again to everybody and y'all take care.